morning everyone. I had to make a decision. Would I wear traditional choir dress this morning? So I looked around and thought, is the setting such that choir dress is appropriate or some other kind of robe? And decided not. In fact, I feel decidedly overdressed uh, in a suit. However, whatever we wear, we come before a God who is ready to engage with us. From your service sheet, grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us and actually, it's good to remember that this is the day that the Lord has made. What a week. A week ago, um, I was in the south, uh, and the temperature was somewhere up there. And then a few days later, there had been a 20 degree drop. And you begin to think, what is happening in the world? Wars and rumours of wars, droughts, and then floods. And I'm talking about this week, not over the last decade. And now strikes in a big way seem to be back, not making any political observation, but chaos seems to be. It all can feel very negative. It can almost feel hopeless. When Jesus was preparing his disciples for what lay ahead for them in the world, he talked to them about some of the things that the world was going to throw at them. And uh, you know, the world can throw some pretty horrible things into the lives of us people. And Jesus then said this to them. Remember, it is from John chapter 16. I've told you these things, that you might have peace. In the world you will have tribulations, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. We meet together today to worship a sovereign God, and we can live securely under that sovereignty, whatever it is we experience. So let's stand to sing of this sovereign God, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty.
about our time of confession. Firstly, a few moments of quiet as we prepare ourselves. together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world, and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. We pray together. Father eternal, giver of light and grace, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in what we have thought, in what we have said and done, through ignorance, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We have wounded your love and marred your image in us. We are sorry and ashamed and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and lead us out from darkness to walk as children of light. Amen. Scripture tells us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So hear these words with reassurance. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As the forgiven people of God, let's stand to sing our next hymn. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. <coughs>
holiday club that's been happening here all week to bring the power reading. And the first reading can be found on page 819 in the Old Testament section of the Bible. It is taken from Ezekiel chapter 36, beginning at the 22nd verse. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nation shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when through you I display my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses and from all your idols I will cleanse you. A new heart I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and make you follow my statutes and be careful to observe my ordinances. The second reading can be found on page 90 in the New Testament section of the Bible. It is taken from John's Gospel, chapter 3, beginning at the first verse. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen. Yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. 
And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his, his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, a uh, very good morning to you. Lovely to be with you. Stephen, thank you so much for helping me lead this service. It's a great blessing to me personally and also to us. Norman, you read beautifully. I must try and get you involved in church work a little bit more. <laughs> Bring you on, that sort of thing. <laughs> um, Matthew, not wanting to embarrass you, but very sorry to hear about your, your late father's death recently and love and prayers and support from your Christian family here to you and to your uh, family. Uh, Joe, where are you? We'll be mentioning uh, your family a little bit later in the notices. Without further ado, a few moments of quietness in the Lord's presence in his house on his day, that um, his spirit would speak to us each one. May the words of my mouth, the thoughts and meditations of all our hearts be now and always pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our strength and redeemer. Amen. Amen. Last week I recall mentioning in John's Gospel uh, there is often a story, and you have the story, but you have a deeper meaning to tease out. And that's certainly one way John does his writing. Uh, the other way, self-evidently, is that John tells a story, a fairly predictable kind of um, storytelling to make a point. He makes the point at the end. And so you have a story of a blind man, and you have a point about Jesus being the light of the world. You have a story about fountains, and you have a thought that actually there's going to be a well stream of life coming from within us. Uh, without further ado, where we're going this morning is the story of Jesus and Nicodemus, and then at the end, you have this great statement to unlock it all. So in Hamlet, Act 3, I think, you have that statement, to be or not to be. That's the question. Young Hamlet was pondering the afterlife. To be or not to be. I'm not going to do Shakespeare Act 3. We're looking at the Bible, John chapter 3. And just as that piece was probably one of the greatest pieces of writing in English literature, so you have the very famous John chapter 3, verse 16, the end of the point of the story, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shouldn't perish, but have eternal life. We know it so well, or I trust we do. What I want to do is to look at this under three headings, and make some very, very clear contemporary references. And as we prayed, I hope the Spirit of God speaks to our lives accordingly. So to be or not to be, to God or not to God. To God or not to God, that really is a very, very big question. I remember sitting with a minister and I often reflect on this myself, that actually sometimes all you need to do is sit down and think, there is a God. And then just be quiet. Just just sit and be still. Actually, isn't that in the Bible somewhere? <laughs> just realise that. Be still and know that I'm God. Just stop, just stop. God or not God. Of course you've got your faith, of course you've got the hymns, of course you've got your Christian family, of course you've got all the convictions, but to not God, here's the contemporary relevance. There are a number of people today for whom belief 
in a not God or atheism is not just so much becoming a part of life, it's becoming a militant exercise to make people who do believe in God, like us, feel uncomfortable. I suppose the professional terminology is militant atheism. It's not just that they're atheists, they are atheists and really, really do say, but there is no God, and you need to hear this. I don't want to worry you, but I've listened to some of their lectures and talks, and they're actually quite persuasive, actually. I mean, they, they know what they're doing. The arguments are very, very powerful. They'll fill buildings, hopefully not churches. They've certainly got their conventions and their conferences, thousands of people listening on their every word as to why you should not believe in God. The soft and cuddly uh, format of this, which you might have heard of recently, is of course Richard Dawkins. Interestingly, if you do dig beneath his writings, you'll find even he is saying, or actually I think I've come to the conclusion the best way to live the world in a Christian possible way, but please bear in mind, there isn't a God. <laughs> I'm digressing slightly, but do look at the writings of Tom Holland, someone who isn't, who is sympathetic to the Christian cause, who certainly wouldn't be preaching about Jesus, uh, the life of the Spirit and the growth of the Church, but even he would say, as the development of humanity has gone on, it's the Christian cause that's helped the whole thing hold together. So there are some massive inconsistencies. Not wanting to step on anyone's toes, please, but one of my professional lots as a vicar is to actually conduct funeral services and to negotiate with loved ones what happens at those final moments. And there is almost an escalation now of people who are requesting, not vicars, but someone that's known in the trade as a civil celebrant. And so you take your form at the hospital, or Church of England, or you wander into your undertakers, or I'm Church of England. Now you're actually saying, but I don't want Church of England. In fact, I'm, I'm really very concerned. I don't want God at all. I have to say, some of these people are really very good. But it is interesting at a popular level how adamant and concerned people are that there really isn't a God, and I don't want any reference made to him. Some fascinating inconsistencies, and to bore you for a few moments when we're putting together services for the life of loved ones, of course I want a Christian service. Of course I want a Christian vicar. Can't always tell. <laughs> Of course I want some hymns, but actually I'm quite relaxed if there's a piece of poetry or a contemporary pop song or a piece of literature. What's interesting to me when you have these civil celebrants conducting these services, most are very militant where we keep God completely out of the picture, but the really mixed up ones are saying, well, I don't mind if you say the Lord's Prayer. Or I don't mind if you sing a hymn or two. But actually, if you don't believe in God, To be or not to be, to God or not to God. Notice in the story that John records at which this fundamental defining statement is made, Jesus, we need to listen to him, speaks to Nicodemus who has questions, points to one inexcusable and undeniable fact in the course of the whole of human history when he is lifted up. The cross on which Jesus died happened. Of course the atheist would say, well, he's a Jew. Of course the atheist would say it didn't make any difference. That is another story, but he was lifted up. Whether you're with the Catholic Church, you have his body on the cross, or whether you're with the Protestant Church, and it's empty because of the resurrection, neither here nor there the cross happened. And in this Jesus... God was there. To God or not to God, that is the question. I hope today you won't be unhinged or destabilised by the rise of militant atheism. My personal recommendation to you is just to let them get on with it. Don't try and challenge them at all. Pray for them, 
and the Lord himself will open their eyes. Some of them will probably be like Nicodemus, coming in their thoughts and prayers at night and wondering in the stillness, hmm, God is there. To love or not to love, that also is the question for God so loved the world. Love is very important when it comes to talking about God. Principally because that's how he's defined. You cut him through in his very being if you could do that and you will find love. Even John says in quite simple terms, God is love. To love or not to love, that really is the question. I have to say I'm not the greatest parent in the world. I've had my go at it and that's it. They're going to get on with life themselves now. And I'm certainly not going to write a book on parenting. But if I was to say to one or two people that this is how you should give it a go, I think most of us would get this. So here we are, darlings. You're off to do your exams. I tell you what, I love you. But you know what? If you don't get a really good grade, I'm not going to love you. Now, I'll tell you what, that really is not great parenting, okay? <laughs> so notice what it says here. God so love the world that he expects everything about you to be perfect. God so loves you that he expects you to be doing this. Sadly, even many church people find that they are living not under grace but under law. What does it say in the Old Testament? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. Your neighbour as yourself. Don't commit adultery. Don't commit murder even if you feel like it. Notice these Ten Commandments come after the Lord had rescued his people from Egypt because he loves them. The law is there to keep us in God's love. It can't in any way, shape or form help us feel loved by God. Nothing you will ever do in the future, nothing that's ever happened to you in the past will stop God loving you. He just is like that. You might not love yourself. That's another question. You might not feel God loves you. That is another question. But if you're going to ask God to come and preach a sermon and say, what do you like? And he says, I just love you. That's the end of it. I guess we need to listen to that. To love or not to love, that really is the question. For God so loved the world that he gave. Now here's something I feel most strongly about. Let me try and put it like this. How do we describe the fact that God does love us? Even the word agape there in John means literally it's giving love. With no strings attached. He's not expecting anything from you on your past. He's certainly not looking for anything from you on your future. He just loves you. Well, how does he do that? Well, he gives of himself. How the Lord gives of himself to make sure you feel love and are eternally secure is a very, very interesting question. To God or not to God, to love or not to be loved, to give or not to give, this really is a question. Of course, Jesus himself points Nicodemus as he points us to his cross on which God himself was there, causing us to be loved as sins and folly and all that's within and without in the world that's wrong is somehow dealt with. How is it that we should best describe that God gives to us so that we should be loved? Here's how I find some Christian churches, and sadly some Christians, believe it should be done. It's as if God was punishing his son. Some people describe it as God is like a cosmic sadist, you see, who takes his child, his only Jesus, his only son, and there he is on the cross, making atonement, punishing Jesus for what should have been ours. 
is known professionally as penal substitutionary atonement. There is an element of that there within the scriptures, but it has to be incredibly nuanced and interpreted. For many people today feel that life is actually punishing them. Many people today have had the misfortune of being inappropriately punished and disciplined by their parents. Sadly, increasing numbers of people are putting their hand up and saying, but I've been punished and abused inappropriately by the Christian church or its leaders and its people. It really won't do to put it out there that God is into punishment, venting his anger on a world and having it out with his son, who he almost did, seems to enjoy putting on the cross and punishing the ultimate cosmic sadist. No wonder if people are not going to believe in a God like that. I frankly certainly don't. If you want to know the professional answer, there are at least nine views of the atonement within the New Testament itself. Penal substitutionary atonement is one of the hardest to describe, and that's only one of nine. In the rest of the scriptures, the Old and New Testament together, there are many, many ways in which God himself gives to his world in order that all that's wrong within it might not stop God being God and loving us. Shouldn't we be surprised that actually God is God and has got it? You know, if you give a job to someone, you say, oh, I wonder if this one's going to work out all right. You give a job to someone else and you just look at them and you think, oh, they've got it. When you look at God in the face, has he got his world? Has he got his problems in the world? Yes, he certainly has. Jesus Christ was lifted up on the cross. All that was wrong within, all that was wrong without, is somehow dealt with and contained by this Jesus. He wasn't being punished. He was holding all that's wrong within us and in the world within himself. Had a beautiful illustration of that this week. In fact, as you know, we've had Holiday Club and my wife who's got uh, off the scales ability, she's a teacher of children with special needs, was looking after a child with particular special needs. Not sure what the appropriate professional term with, I think it was proprioceptive input if you're into all this, but basically you're looking at troubled children that can't help being troubled. It's either what's happened to them or it's there in their genes and there's appropriate ways of helping children that are troubled. And proprioceptive input for the numpties and the idiots in the room like me is when you give them a hug. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, frankly, I don't need to go to university to realise that. But, you know, it's all right. I, I, I've got you. I, I, I'm holding you. You, you. You're loved. It's all right. God so loved the world that he gave, that he, he hugged it within himself as Jesus was there on the cross and then the empty cross comes as the tomb is empty and God says, do you know what, Mark, if you give me a job of looking after the world, I've got it. I can handle it. I'm God. What a statement. Such love is so amazing, demands my soul, my life, my all. Perhaps this morning, many of us need to just find time to reflect that there is a God. Calm the whole thing down. Perhaps some of us have realised that actually I don't feel loved. My parents didn't do a great job. Maybe they did do a great job and life has been hard to you. Maybe you find it hard to think that actually it's going to be alright. That's how it is. Your love 
God will give to you. Moments quiet and I'll lead you in a prayer. Father, we've been looking at a passage of scripture that talks about the world. We recognise that it's our prayers, our lives that we're thinking about. And so we want to thank you this day for loving us, for opening our hearts and our lives and our eyes to all that Jesus is and can be. Help us to know we're loved, and help us to live lives that show that we are. And for a world that often ignores you or speaks against you, we pray for your love and mercy to be shed upon them, that all might see our Saviour lifted high upon the cross, and when he is, may they be drawn to himself. So may your blessing rest upon us and those for whom we've been thinking and praying even this day. In Jesus' name. If you've ever wondered what being an open evangelical means, Marcus described it to you. And what a blessing that is. For we worship a God who does not condemn and who does not bear anger towards us. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Come unto me and rest. Lay down, thou weary one, lay down thy head upon my breast. Let's stand to sing.
people sitting in a room and noting what they thought we should believe. It came after years of prayerful thought, of occasional disagreements that sometimes led to fights, even battles. But this is what we believe as Christians today. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So we sit or kneel for our intercessions, led by Sue. As we prepare to pray, I'm, I'm noticing all these stickers on the cross, the name of the children who we're at the Holiday Club this week, all around the cross. And we might know some of the names, but as Sue leads us in intercession, let's remember the ones we know and give thanks to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the witness of Nicodemus, who had a teachable spirit. We pray that like him, we too may have a teachable spirit and be prepared to come to you with all our needs and questions. Help us not to trust in our own understanding, knowing that you not only have the answer, but the, that you are the answer. Be with us now as we bring to you our needs and thanksgiving. Ever-creating God, in our church we have this week held holiday club and learned about the amazing world you've created. Yet the beauty of this planet is blemished and its health is failing because we don't take proper care of it. The global warming has been evident, especially during these past few months. Lord, revive our collective conscience and restore our sense of responsible stewardship of the miracles of nature that we may hand on our precious planet in good shape and set it on the path to recovery. Help us to remember that God saw everything he made and indeed it was very good. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayer. We pray for peace and hope to abound in the world. Many countries have been troubled by natural disaster, drought, forest and bushfires, plagues, floods and mudslides, destroying homes and livelihoods. We pray for Afghanistan and East Africa suffering from hunger. We pray for provision of nourishing food and clean water. And may they all feel your love surround them. We pray for countries going through conflict and political unrest. And we continue to lift you the war in Ukraine. We ask for protection for all those who are vulnerable. And we pray that solutions for a cessation of the war will be found. We ask for peace for those who need peace. Reconciliation for those who need reconciliation. And comfort for those who don't know what tomorrow will bring. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we lift our own country to you, which is undergoing uncertainty through strikes, cost of living crisis, and political upheaval. We pray for our Queen Elizabeth, who is becoming physically more frail, but we give thanks that she continues to gain her spiritual strength from you. Bless and guide her. 
as we await the announcement of a new Prime Minister. We pray that the one appointed will uphold justice and honour. And may all their decisions and deliberations be for the good of all people. Praying that long-term solutions will be found to help those struggling with the cost of living. And we pray that you will guide the direction of our country. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, you call us each to different work in your kingdom according to our gifts. We pray for all who have been called into ministry, remembering Archbishops Justin and Stephen, our Bishops Pete and Sophie, and particularly we pray and give thanks for our leadership here at All Saints. Keep your call fresh in their hearts, renewing and refreshing their spirits for the work ahead. May your Holy Spirit strengthen them and give fresh encouragement and new vision. We also give thanks that Cam's has begun to settle well into the team. And Lord, we give particular thanks for Rosie for her hard work done for the holiday club. May she have a restful and refreshing holiday. We give thanks for all the volunteers in all capacities who helped during the week and that there will be an uptake in volunteers to help with children's activities during the year. We especially ask your blessing on all the children who attended. May they continue to talk about their experiences at Holiday Club and begin to want to know more about how Jesus can be their friend and saviour. We pray for our young people growing up in an unstable and confusing world. We pray for those who have received their A-level results this week and those awaiting GCSEs next week. For those who have received their results and achieved their grades, we are thankful. Others will be disappointed. Help them to understand. It's not a measure of their worth but perhaps a chance for a new start. Lord, you have them in your keeping. They cannot pass beyond the reach of your love and care. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. I came to Jesus as I was, weary and worn and sad. I found him in a resting place, and he has made me glad. Loving God, there are people who we care about, who have a variety of needs right now. Some are ill, some depressed, some bereaved, and those suffering with an impossible situation. To pray for them is the best way we can love them. So we pray for the people who are on our hearts and those who care for them. We lift them now up to you, Lord, for you to touch with your love and your life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now let us bring our prayers together by saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The moment you've been waiting for, it's um, sometimes the stand-up uh, part of the service, the notices.
Thank you, Stephen. Uh, short and sweet today, I don't want to spoil the moment. Uh, Sue, thanks for leading those prayers uh, so lovingly uh, for many in need in our community today. But all these notices are important. If you've not got it on email or missed your paper copy, it's there in the welcome area, but to underline uh, from Simon's letter, massive thanks to those of you praying for Holiday Club. Uh, one of my mottos is never work with children, animals or clergy. Uh, so I'm really glad some people could be bothered to work with children this last week. It really has gone great. Uh, more numbers than we are an anticipating. No major problems. Truth will out when we'll see how many of them will come back. So hence it's left like this uh, today for the service following this one. And then the Heritage Weekend. Thank you for the little team putting that together. I know Margaret will be embarrassed if I uh, alert you to her wonderful churchyard tour, which I find side-splittingly humorous. I mean, I'm crying with laughter. Some of these illustrations she comes out with that these people have long gone dead and buried in the churchyard. But it's, you know, it's really is very, very informative. If you've not heard Margaret before, you really must uh, come along to that. Plenty of other little things to intrigue. Principally speaking, it's not just for us. It's for people in the community, it's an easy way in uh, before they get drawn into the life of Christ and the life of his church. I think I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Stephen. A reminder that the wholeness team will be available down here to my right to pray with you about anything at the close of this service. Our offertory is brought forward a token of what we offer to God, a token of what we want to express in our lives. Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendour and the majesty, for everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you, and of your own do we give. Believing in God, following the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a gospel to proclaim in word and in deed, in the way we live our lives, in the way we relate to one another. We have a gospel to proclaim good news in all the earth. Let's stand to say.
earlier, I understand loss of James McQuillan, who chose with us this morning. Uh, many of us knew James his whole life. And I know Joe wants to make it clear that all in the congregation are welcome to that service. Details are in the notices. And so we prepare to go out into this coming week in the love of God. And so let's receive his blessing. The Lord bless you and watch over you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his counsel upon you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.